Good morning, St. Andrew. Hope you're all doing well. Reverend Kim has invited me to speak on the Holy Spirit, which is a huge subject, not least because he's God. So my plan for the next three times I'm with you is to cover three important topics. Today, we're looking at spiritual gifts, God's tools to do the job. So let's pray before I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Heavenly Father, we thank you for filling us with the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit who inspired Paul to write these words. Help us to have humble, teachable hearts, so that we might understand and apply to our lives what we hear today. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So the passage this morning is 1 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 11, and then the first part of verse 31. Verse 1. Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to dumb idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues." All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Now, eagerly desire the greater gifts. Despite being half English, my daughters have none of the reserved Englishness which makes up most of the adults of that species. When they were younger, they weren't shy asking for presents. They were then, and they still are, very good receivers. It was a case of grab it, unwrap it, and use it. They knew the value of everything, but the price of nothing. The most costly toys could be once looked at and dismissed, and the cheapest ones most overplayed and annoying. That's the way children are. How a gift is received or rejected reveals a lot about the recipient, and if they receive it, how they then use it or tragically misuse it. But most important, it reveals how healthy their relationship is with the giver. Do they value the gift more than the giver? Too often, that's what can happen with God. We can immaturely make our focus the spiritual gifts and we can forget the wonderful Lord God who freely gives them to us. Receiving a spiritual gift is not a sign of maturity, spiritual maturity or otherwise. It's a sign of God's generosity and his giving nature. We also need to learn how to use the spiritual gifts to serve others, and to make sure everything we do is about the kingdom of God rather than ourselves and our kingdom. To be spiritually mature necessitates love. Love is the quality which handles every gift and talent correctly. That's why on October 16th I'll be talking about love, which is essential and non-negotiable. And on October 23rd, my topic will be how to live by the Spirit, 
with a focus on the fruit of the Spirit, which is the hallmark of Christian spiritual maturity. The Corinthian church was into spiritual gifts in a massive way, but they were also very immature, a potent and dangerous combination. Their church was divided. Now, it's impossible for the Holy Spirit to cause division in the Church of Jesus Christ. But what can happen is that the Spirit can expose our lack of love and our immaturity. The Corinthians prided themselves on the spiritual gifts they'd been given. They, they showed them off like trophies. They paraded them around as if they'd earned them or deserved them. Tragically, they believed that their gifts were a measure of their importance to God and to others. And in so doing, they were revealing their immaturity and their insecurity. Imagine the shock in the room when Paul's letter was read out and they heard these words from verse 1. Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be ignorant. Ignorant! From Paul's perspective, they were immature novices, mere kids trying to play with the adults. How humbling. I suspect it got their attention and that there were a lot of indignant, unhappy campers in the room. They had clearly received many spiritual gifts, but it seems that they were confused as to how to incorporate the gifts for the benefit of all, both in the church and in the world. Ignorance is not bliss, it's foolishness. And an ignorance of spiritual gifts often leads to fear and the rejection of them. That's why I intentionally use the word tools, so that we don't glamorise these gifts. And they are fantastic and powerful and useful when it comes to building the kingdom of God. But they're not to be worshipped. They're simply tools given to us to successfully complete Jesus' great commission. In 1 Corinthians 4.20, Paul wrote, The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Spiritual gifts are necessary for spiritual power. They demonstrate to others that Jesus is alive, and they're signs pointing folk to Jesus. Verses 4-6 to six talk about different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. Different kinds of service, but the same Lord, that's Jesus. And different kinds of workings, but the same God, that's the Father. The Trinity is involved with all of the gifts. These verses show us that there are three progressions when it comes to spiritual gifts. First, verse 4, simply gifts. The gifts of the Spirit are available to every Christian as and when we need them. For example... If someone you know is sick, even if you haven't been involved with ministering to the sick, because you are a child of the Father, you can ask the Holy Spirit for the gift of healing, and then you can pray for them to be healed. In this sense, these are one-off gifts for one-off moments, which means that no Christian has an excuse for doing nothing. We can't say, well, I didn't pray for them to be healed because well, I don't have that spiritual gift. If someone asks you about your Christian faith, don't mumble. Don't say, well, I'll have to introduce them to Reverend Kim. No, ask the Spirit for the gift of evangelism and then tell them about your relationship with Jesus. If someone is new to the church, don't ignore them because you don't have the gift of welcoming. Ask the Holy Spirit for the gift and then step up and make a new friend. Second, verse 5, service. This occurs when you frequently find yourself using a particular gift or talent. Now, for example, you might have a talent for hospitality. You're always making people welcome in the church, in your home and in the, in the workplace. But if you want God the Father to use that talent for his glory, 
If you want to make Jesus known, if you want to transform people's lives, then you have to submit that talent under the lordship of Jesus. You lay it down before him. You give it back to him. And then you ask the Holy Spirit to supernaturally enhance that natural talent for Jesus's glory alone. And we must do this for every talent that we've been given. Third, working, verse 6. This happens when your constant use of a particular gift or set of gifts is not only effective, but it floats your boat, it pushes your buttons and it gets you out of bed in the morning. You long to learn more about it so that you can be even more effective. You, you study, you practice, you discuss, you, you experiment, you sacrifice. Another word for this is ministry. I believe that every follower of Jesus can develop an effective spiritual ministry. But here's the reality check. It will take time, sacrifice, patience, endurance, perseverance and humility. The rewards are priceless. But experience has shown me that too few are willing to pay such a high price. A healthy local church encourages every member ministry. In other words, every member of this church community has a God-given, God-honoring, effective and necessary ministry which the Father has designed and tailor-made. Your ministry will be fulfilling, challenging, fruitful and satisfying. But beware, it will also be hard work and there will be great temptations. You'll be tempted to give up on it or to, to desire it for the wrong reasons or to seek personal glory and recognition or to make it your identity. Moving on to verse 7. Now to each one of you the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Every follower of Jesus, with no exceptions, receives spiritual gifts. No one misses out. But they are given for the common good. They're not given for our own glory and benefit. We receive them so that we can bless others and build up Jesus' church. Other lists of spiritual gifts can be found in Romans 12 and Ephesians 4 and 1 Peter 4. But these lists, including the ones in 1 Corinthians uh, 12, the one we're looking at today, they're not exhaustive. For example, the gift of craftsmanship is mentioned in Exodus 31. Some gifts are naturally occurring, like hospitality, I mentioned it earlier, or leadership or artistic ability or, or, or physical strength or music or whatever it might be. Other gifts are not naturally occurring. They're what we call supernatural and verses 8 to 10 gives a list of some of these supernatural gifts. I'm going to briefly explain these gifts. Very brief. Verse 8, the message of wisdom. This gift helps us to know what to do, what to say in a specific, often difficult situation. Jesus received a message of wisdom which enabled him to respond to a trick question. And so he replied, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's and to God that which is God's. And the message of knowledge, which is to know something that you could not possibly know unless God had revealed it to you. Jesus re received a message of knowledge when he told the Samaritan woman in John 4, go and get your husband. And he revealed that knowledge when he said to her, you've had five husbands and the man you are with is not your husband. Wisdom and knowledge often go together. Sometimes we might receive some knowledge which we wisely do not share. Often we've been given it to help us to pray, to intercede in the situation or for the person. Verse 9, faith. This is supernatural faith, which is beyond simple belief. When most have given up, this is the confident faith that God will act miraculously. But be careful, 
Because if this faith doesn't come from the Holy Spirit, if it's, if it's bravado and wishful thinking, you will look very foolish. Peter in Acts chapter 3 said to a 40-year-old man who'd never walked in his life, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And taking the man by the right hand, Peter pulled him to his feet. That was amazing. It was supernatural and it was from the Holy Spirit. Gifts of healing. Note the word gifts here is plural because there are different types of sicknesses. There's physical, there's emotional, there's mental and there's spiritual. And some folk need to be healed in more than one of those areas. Often we need a combination of spiritual gifts to complete the mission. Peter in Acts 3 had supernatural faith in the gift of physical healing. But then a crowd gathered because the man was healed. And Peter used the gifts of evangelism and preaching. Verse 10. Miraculous powers. We see this when Jesus multiplied food. Or in Acts 13 when Paul told Elimas, a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet, that he would be blinded. Prophecy. This is either foretelling or forthtelling. Foretelling is being given knowledge by God about the future. Forthtelling is having the discernment to know what is happening right now in the spiritual realms. Chapter 14 verse 1 tells us that prophecy is the greatest gift. Distinguishing between spirits. This supernatural gift is linked with forthtelling, having the ability to discern what is of God, what is of human design, and what is of the devil, and then knowing how to pray and act effectively. Speaking in different kinds of tongues, other languages. So what is tongues? It's the ability to speak in a language which you did not learn and do not understand. What's the purpose of tongues? Threefold, to prophesy, to praise, and to pray for others. Tongues is what we call a gateway gift. If you're willing to trust God with your mouth in something simple like this, then he can trust you with greater speaking gifts like teaching and encouragement and prophecy. Interpretation of tongues. This is when someone gives the meaning of a publicly spoken tongue in a language that those gathered can comprehend. For us, that would be English. And when this occurs, according to chapter 14, verse 5, it's the equivalent of prophecy. All gifts from God are priceless. Please don't ever contemplate refusing, declining, or, or dismissing a spiritual gift. How dare we do that? How do we receive spiritual gifts and use them with maturity? We need, first of all, to be in a right relationship with the giver. That's all three members of the Trinity, if you remember. Jesus taught in Luke eleven thirteen, How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? If we are certain that we are much loved children of the Father, then we can have the confidence to ask him for the Holy Spirit and the faith to receive the Spirit and the gifts that he brings. Next, we need to constantly remind ourselves that they are, by definition, gifts, which means that they are unearned and undeserved. And finally, we need to be aware that if we don't use them, we will lose them. They're not trophies to put in a cabinet to impress others. Unused gifts will be taken back. We also lose the spiritual gifts when we use them to bring glory to ourselves or when we hurt others with them. Verse 31a, the one right at the end of the chapter, tells us to eagerly desire the greater gifts. A literal translation of the Greek, eagerly desire, is to long for with all your guts. It's very passionate, isn't it? This is not a disinterested, lazy, so-so attitude. This is a passionate and desperate cry. So when you ask the Father to be specific and expectant, uh, you've got to name the gifts. That's how you're specific. That's how you're expectant. 
You've got to name it. You've got to say what you want them for. You've got to desire them. You can't say, well, if you've got one available, one left over from somewhere else. You, you go to the Father and you say, my friend doesn't know Jesus and I'm desperate that they don't spend eternity without him. Father, I implore you, I beg you, please give me the gift of evangelism so that I can clearly explain the gospel to them and they can accept Jesus as their Lord and be forgiven and adopted into your family and receive eternal life. I'm desperate. I'm begging you. You come to the Father, you say, my sister is suffering so much with physical pain. Please, Father, answer my prayer. Give me the gift of healing so that they might be released from their agony and restored to full health. That's eagerly desiring. Verse 11 reminds us that the same Holy Spirit who gives all these gifts also determines who gets what. Don't worry about asking for the wrong gift. It's the Spirit's decision, which is a very good thing because he knows best and he never makes mistakes. This also leaves no room for immature boasting about any gift we do receive. There's no room for jealousy either. I wish I had her gift. The gift that you wish you had would either not suit you or would make you proud or it might actually prevent someone else from stepping out in faith and using their gift. Verse 11 also reminds us that the Holy Spirit is a person, a he, not an it or a power. This is not the force of Star Wars. He is God and he is holy and he's boss and he's, he's very powerful, so don't mess with him. Because he is God... There are some constants. First, because the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible, 2 Timothy 3.16, he will never contradict himself. So the gifts he gives will never lead us to live in any way that is contrary to the Bible. Second, because the Holy Spirit always brings glory to the Father and to the Son, the gifts he gives will always bring glory to God and to no one else. Third, because the Holy Spirit is utterly good and he empowers Christians in their witness about Jesus, the gifts he gives will always be for the good of people and will draw them to Jesus and help them grow in spiritual maturity by becoming like Jesus. Fourth, because the source of the spiritual gifts is the Holy Spirit, unless they are used in his power, they cannot be effective for the kingdom of God. They will make no eternal difference. Fifth, because one of the priorities of the Holy Spirit is to make the church holy and victorious, the gifts he gives will always edify the church. And sixth, because the Holy Spirit is a God of order, the gifts he gives will always complement and enhance the gifts of other Christians. Every child of the Father, every Christian receives spiritual gifts. That's great news. But this means that no one is totally dependent upon others. No one can say that they've got nothing to offer. This is called apathy and passivity. And it results in a dull church where only a few people do everything. Church is supposed to be a vital, vibrant, powerful fellowship where the congregation is not an audience, they are participants. They're not consumers, they're contributors. And no one receives all the gifts, which means that no one is independent. I don't need anyone else I can manage on my own. That's called pride. Instead, we are called to interdependence. I need you and you need me and we need them. As J. John said, none of us has got it together, but together we've got it. If you want to grow in using your spiritual gifts, and I'm sure that you do, then fling yourself into the church. Jesus loves his church. He died for her. The Father gives gifts for his church, which means that we should always be ministering in the local church. Whatever gifts you do receive, use them wholeheartedly for the Father's kingdom, for Jesus' glory, and use them because it's great fun to minister effectively in the Spirit's power. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for adopting me as your child. 
and I confidently and expectantly ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit and to give to me all the spiritual gifts that I am eagerly desiring. Lord Jesus, I want to honour you and be an active contributor in your church. Please help me to grow in maturity so that when I serve, I will be a blessing to all. Holy Spirit, I submit to you. Please help me to grow and develop the ministry you created me to enjoy. Please give me opportunities to move in your power and to use your gifts to make Jesus known. I ask all these things in the name of my Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you all so much for listening. God bless you.